We continue the lectures about uh, piano arithmetic with uh, a segment about arithmetic formulas. The main goal of this lecture is to uh, show that um, while PA0 or Q is a rather weak theory, it can still capture uh, to some extent truth about the natural numbers. To describe the kind of truth that um, uh, Q can capture about N, uh, we need uh, the notion of a bounded quantifier. We've already seen bounded quantifiers when we were talking about uh, primitive recursion, um, where um, closure under bounded quantifiers was one of the important properties that helped us show that a lot of functions are actually primitive recursive. Um, let's um, revisit this and make this actually a little bit more precise what exactly a bounded quantifier is. So uh, basically, those are just abbreviation of certain formulas, namely exists x t phi is just shorthand for exists x, x is less than t and phi, and uh, for all x less than t phi is uh, just shorthand for for all x, if x is less than t, then phi. Um, here, of course, t is a term, and it's also important that x is not among the variables of t. Similar to um, the case of primitive recursion, the idea of bounded quantifiers is, of course, that they are very limited in expressiveness, um, which um, in turn results in the uh, predicates that they uh, uh, define or describe um, being rather simple. Taking bounded quantifiers as a basis, we can now define a hierarchy of formulas, namely, um, as I already said, the base case are uh, formulas that only contain bounded quantifiers, so where, or rather where the, uh, all the quantifiers that appear are bounded. Uh, there might not be any. Um, sigma 1 formulas are formulas of the form exists x psi, where psi is delta 0, and pi 1, accordingly, is uh, a formula of the form for all x psi, where psi is delta 0. We can continue this now, uh, counting the quantifier changes in the formula, and this way get sigma n plus 1 and pi n plus 1 formulas, where phi exists uh, of the form exists x psi with psi pi n would be a sigma n plus 1 formula, and uh, accordingly the similar definition for pi n plus 1. Right? So you would count the number of quantifier changes to determine the level in of the formula in the arithmetical hierarchy. So for example, um, take the formula that there exists infinitely many prime numbers. Um, so therefore all x there exists a y that is bigger than x and that y is prime. We've seen that y prime is uh, a delta zero predicate uh, when we uh, looked at um, primitive uh, recursive functions. Um, so this whole thing would be um, pi 2, right? because we have for all that exists. Um, there's a little um, a bit of work here, because strictly speaking, we are not strictly of this form here, because we have this delta 0 inside this whole clause here. But there are um, certain equivalent uh, formulations, um, so that you could pull a, a delta 0 predicate, so a bounded quantifier outside here. Um, and so on. So there's a, 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 something called a prenext normal form that um, uh, we haven't really covered, but is uh, not hard to prove that the, this can be brought in a form covered by uh, these definitions here. In the example of um, being prime or in the infinity of primes um, on the um, uh, previous slide, we already saw that there's really an underlying hierarchy, not of formulas, but predicates. So we say a predicate uh, as a subset of the natural numbers is delta zero, uh, sigma one, respectively, pi one, and so on, if it can be defined over the natural numbers, uh, and that is the standard model here, um, by a, a formula of the corresponding type. 
And since every predicate that is definable, for example, by a sigma 1 formula is also definable by a sigma 2 formula or uh, by a pi 2 formula by introducing some um, dummy vacuous quantifiers, um, we get a true hierarchy of predicates starting with the delta 0 predicates then uh, going up to sigma 1 predicates, pi 2, pi 1 predicates, and so on, level 2, level 3. So in the case of predicates, we can um, furthermore do something that we cannot really do with formula. Um, namely, we can form the class delta n, which is in the, in the intersection of um, the sigma n predicates and the pi n predicates. So any predicate that can be defined by a sigma n formula and a pi n formula is delta n. And that gives us another kind of intermediate level in this hierarchy here. Right? So we can get the delta 1 and then the delta 2 predicates. And then we have um, this kind of hierarchy here. But keep in mind, this works only for predicates, not for formulas. Right? Um, there is no notion or concept of a delta 1 formula. Um, but uh, for predicates, this will be a very nice notion to have. So um, a little bit, looking ahead a little bit, uh, remember uh, our normal form for RE sets that were the ones that can be brought in the form existential quantifier over uh, a recursive relation. So this seems to be somehow related to sigma 1. CoRE seems to be related likewise to um, pi 1. And uh, we saw that by the complementation theorem, a set is computable if and only if it's um, uh, the set and its complement are both sigma 1. right? So that means that we uh, uh, it looks like delta 1 level here seems to be uh, corresponding to something like this, right? So both uh, the set and its complement can be defined as a sigma 1 set. And we will um, actually make this analogy uh, very precise. But for now, let's um, focus on the uh, delta 0 formulas, so on the lower end of the arithmetical hierarchy. Um, Delta zero formulas have a very nice property in the sense that they're absolute between end extensions. So what what does this mean uh, exactly? So let's assume we have two models of P A naught, and uh, their uh, n is an end extension of M. Uh, uh, um, equivalently, M is an initial segment of N, and let's assume we have a, a tuple A in the smaller structure and we have a delta zero formula. Then it holds that this formula phi um, with uh, at evaluated at A holds in the smallest structure, if and only if it holds in the end extension. So you prove this by induction over um, the formula structure, so the height of the formula. Um, the key ingredient is of course the observation that if you have a formula of this form, right, and this one doesn't have any um, um, quantifiers in it, well, if all the um, variables are now evaluated in the smallest structure, in particular, it means that this term here has to be evaluated into an uh, element in the smallest structure m, right? That means the variable here, the x, is bounded by an element in the smaller structure, right? And um, since it's an um, n is an end extension of m, that means there will be no elements from the bigger structure that are inserted uh, below the evaluation of t here in n. So that means that um, this equivalence holds. So there cannot be new witnesses to a statement like this in uh, in the bigger structure. So having the absoluteness um, between uh, models of um, PA naught that are initial segments or end extensions of each other, respectively, we can now get uh, absoluteness for slightly stronger formulas, um, albeit not the um, 
bidirectional absoluteness we had before. Um, we only get what is called upward and downward absoluteness. Um, so for sigma 1 formulas, we get that if they hold in the smaller structure, then they also hold in the bigger structure, whereas if sigma 1 formulas, pi 1 formulas hold in the bigger structure, then they also hold in the smaller structures. Um, the um, inverse direction is in both cases no longer true. Take for example the pi 1 formula for all x, sx is not equal to x. That is clearly true in uh, n, right, the standard model, but when can construct a model of PA0 where this uh, sentence here is no longer true. This was one of the uh, exercises from the last lesson. Um, so we see that upward absoluteness right, does not uh, no longer apply for pi 1 formulas, for example. Um, the proof here is, of course, using the result for delta 1 and then noticing, for example, for sigma 1 formulas, if you have something um, that holds here, then it holds an existential statement also holds in the bigger structure, because if there's a witness to an existential statement in the smaller structure, right, it must be a witness, uh, it, this must then satisfy a delta zero formula, right, and um, this delta zero formula holds also in um, the bigger structure, and the witness, of course, has to come from the uh, smaller structure. So we have a, um, a delta zero formula that is satisfied then also in the bigger structure. Of course, the reverse implication does not no longer hold because the witness to the existential statement is now unbounded and could be from the bigger structure, which is not present in the smaller structure. An important consequence of this sigma one upward absoluteness is the so-called sigma one completeness of uh, PA zero. Namely, if I have a sigma one sentence that is true in the standard model, then PA zero can actually prove it. And the reason for this is simply, uh, if you recall, that if we had a model of PA naught, then it contained an isomorphic copy of the standard model as an initial segment. And if we assume that sigma holds in N, then by upward absoluteness, because it's a sigma one sentence, it also has to hold in the model M then. And that means by the completeness theorem, uh, PA0 has to prove sigma.